Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guest. In this case, is Zachary Carabell, uh, a, a man of many talents, but most important, very knowledgeable about China at a time uh, when uh, we may be going to World War III with not just Russia, but also China and threatening world order and what have you. And Zachary Carabell comes at it many different ways as an academic, uh, Oxford, you know, Columbia, everything, all the major universities, um, a, a, a financial consultant, investor, a Wall Street player, um, and someone who wrote a, a really important book uh, that I just have reread. It was published in 2009, and it's called Superfusion, How China and America Became One Economy and the Why the World Depends on It. If you consider that statement, one economy, in fact, you even have a, a concept in your book, you refer to China America, China America as one economy. And now uh, there's all this there's sanctions and obstacles and you know, and uh, in one of the great ironies, we fought a long war against communist Vietnam, but now we like communist Vietnam and we want uh, Apple and other companies to shift their production to to uh, Vietnam. So what's going on, uh, Zachary Carabon? <laughs> what's this all about? That is a very, very good question. What is going on? I think... There clearly is a nascent Cold War going on, and there's blame enough to go around. And as you know better than anyone, Bob, you know it, there's blame enough to go around and to explain the 1950s Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, each side clearly is culpable, and that's true today. What is so, uh, I think, benighted and short-sighted on the part of the United States, and frankly, on the part of the Chinese leadership as well. But I take it as an axiom that I'm a U.S. citizen. I have some right to uh, praise or criticize my own society that is a greater right than I have to praise or criticize another society. So one of the conclusions of my book in 2009 is if you think China is a threat, uh, if you don't think China is a threat, uh, the answer to both is focus on your own society, You know, focus on your own house first the kind of the moats in one's own eye rather than the moats in someone else's. And I say, I believe that firmly today, you know, that, 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 that China is going to do what China is going to do. Um, and that's another thing the United States seems not to have gotten either the collective or governmental hint about, which is our ability to coerce China to be different is radically limited. Uh, and our ability to, you know, encourage them to be different is radically limited. And, and that's not a place that the United States is comfortable occupying. You know, we're, we're used to being in a position of power and privilege where we can kind of dictate or coerce or do some carrot and stick that, that does both. And, and, and I don't think that works with China. Um, what is so wrong about, uh, in my view, the current rush toward conflict is that where the Cold War analogy completely falls apart is the economic interdependence. And that was the subject of my book in 2009. And in spite of all of this incredible negativity and headline after headline talking about a Cold War and the end of globalization, bilateral trade between the United States and China this year, you know, even with Trump's 25% tariffs that, that the Biden administration has done nothing to alter, even with all of the negativity, even with all of the animosity, bilateral trade is, is going to be more than ever this year. And that includes U.S. exports to China, not just U.S. imports from China. China remains the fastest growing export market for American goods, a concept that I think would be surprising to most people. And you can go onto the U.S. Census Bureau. This is not a subjective observation on my part. These are you know, statistical realities. Um, the trillion dollars of, intera of, of bilateral interactions and in trade, the, the trillion dollars that China still holds of American treasuries, means that any attempt to like radically sever that relationship is infinitely more costly, nuclear weapons notwithstanding in the 1950s, than severing the US USSR relationship would have been. I mean, we could we could pursue a, a, a political, economic, ideological 
combat with the Soviet Union and with Soviet communism, whatever the hell that meant, uh, with very little domestic economic costs because there was so little interaction between those spheres. That is, I mean, not the case today at all. Semiconductor supply chains alone would be, you can't just like snap your fingers and build them in Vietnam. It's taking Apple years to even source some of the iPhones in Vietnam and other places. You know, it takes years and years and trillions of dollars to rebuild supply chains. And maybe we'll do that by the 2030s. And, you know, we might anyway. But until then, to act like you can just pursue ideological and military and political uh, conflict and competition without recognizing how profoundly intertwined these economies remained, even though we think they're not, I just think is foolish beyond belief. You know, in reading your book, it happens that when I was in another lifetime, a half, well, more than a half century ago, back in 1963, I was a fellow in the Center for Chinese Studies at UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And the conventional wisdom then was that China could never develop. It would always be a basket, economic basket case. It, the population was thought to be too large, somewhere between four and 500 million. They had no petroleum to speak of. They would be wedded to coal. Uh, that would get more and more difficult. Uh, and, and there was one issue after another. Their ideology of being communists uh, would prevent them from ever embracing any rational market solutions. And this was you know, set in stone. Uh, and then Nixon, of all people, did what what Biden and Trump don't seem to want to do. At least Biden met with uh, some of these people, admit, you know, with Putin and uh, Z. Uh, but um, Nixon, this improbable figure who built a career on red baiting uh, communism uh, and Henry Kissinger, had the wisdom to go and negotiate with Mao Zedong, of all people, probably the fiercest of communist leaders, or probably quite unquestionably. And the idea being that we could live in a world, and including not bringing up Taiwan, uh, and accept them. It seems to me what happened after that was there was an assumption that by becoming partners economically in trade and so forth and normalizing, that the Chinese would give up communism. They would have it maybe in name, uh, but it would not be an issue. And, and so to fast forward to where we are now, it seems, and I, and I thought it was one of the great strengths of your book, uh, written uh, what, 12, 13 years ago, which is, no, it, it's a little more complex than that. Uh, and that uh, any leaders of China will have to have some notion of obligation to the whole. And I think that's one of the issues now. We we are threatened by China's move to high tech. Uh, they have to get a bigger share of the pie. They have a billion more people almost than they had before. And they can't just be the factory for, for low level production. They need to get into the big game. And we find that threatening. And I, I, I wonder if that is not the source of the tension now. I mean, clearly in the United States, the conventional wisdom has gone uh, Clinton and then George H.W. Bush agree to um, agree to China, sorry, George W. Bush, agree to the uh, entrance of China into the WTO in December of 2021 because the argument was by bringing China more into the sort of capitalist fold, global economic community, integrating it into the World Trade Organization and global trade uh, would be a massive spur toward opening up and liberalizing China's society, not just their economy. And, you know, once it became clear around 2010, 2011, uh, especially with the, the, the ascension of Xi Jinping, that that wasn't going to happen, that if anything, China was going to manage to pursue this sui generis form of authoritarian capitalism or a, a sort of a system that doesn't really have a name. Uh, the reaction increasingly amongst U.S. elites and policymakers and scholars and public opinion has been, we, we messed up. 
that was wrong. We should never have integrated China into the World Trade Organization because all they did was steal American intellectual property, use that for domestic gains, develop their own uh, domestic champions, as they are called, in things like 5G and wireless communication, in military and cyber uh, warfare, and in um, sort of surveillance and AI, and then also just stole American IP for everything. And that this ended up being a disastrously wrong policy, and you should have just confronted China rather than integrating with them. That's kind of the the way the conventional wisdom has gone. And some of that is, is adamantly articulated by people who were once considered to be Chinophiles, you know, people who were really adamant about integrating and reaching out to China, people like Orville Schell, who I, I like a lot and, and have counted as a friend, but I think whose views on China have really hardened intensively over the years. He was at Berkeley for a lot of years. And a lot of these, yeah, a lot of the pushback. Of, uh, right. A colleague of mine in that China center, I've known Orville forever. But can I just jump in, in 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 one respect? I happened to interview Richard Nixon after he was president, and he was licking his wounds in his office in New York. And I, it was always a mystery to me, what, the opening to China, because it, it it was like a peacenik's wildest dream, right? This was basically the argument of peace-oriented people around the world who were not thought to be realistic, which is, you know, give peace a chance. And and Nixon did it. And and he, it wasn't even, you know, people said, well, it was Kissinger. No, Nixon wrote an article for Foreign Affairs magazine before he was president uh, talking about the need to do this. And then after, uh, when he was in his forced retirement, he wrote books about how you develop peace. And Nixon, and I dare say Kissinger, has uh, and, and just recently reiterated this notion of realism, which is they're not going to be stop being what they are. And what they are is a product of their own culture. And and this idea of, of Chinese uh, society with uh, 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 Marxism with Chinese characteristics, which is the speech that he gave in 2018 that they say we should all read. And now they're having their party Congress in three weeks, which I'm sure he's going to reiterate this, is a very interesting blending. And what he says in that is, look, we had this revolution in the most improbable country. It's supposed to come in an advanced country. Nobody ever told us how to build socialism in a very poor country. We don't want to go the way of the Russians. That was a failure. And we make mistakes and we try to improve it. And reform has, you know, uh, uh, a lot of impetus here. And what is so interesting about your book. I really recommend, you have a more recent book, and we could talk about that, Harriman and Banking and, and everything, but I would really recommend people read your book that uh, was published in 2009, because you acknowledge that tension. Yes, they will be more like us. And by the way, one point you make in your book, we needed China. The first companies that went there, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, uh, Avon calling Federal Express, they needed, you know, they didn't, they were, the market back here was tired and old and not particularly receptive to them, uh, particularly as the internet age emerged. They went there and saved themselves. And it wasn't a one way street at all. And if we think about the pandemics, my God, the Chinese kept us alive through Amazon purchases during this pandemic. So it was a mutual thing. But the key point that we're getting from Z is listen, we have to deliver on a promise to the masses, <laughs> archaic as it sounds. And we can't do that, particularly once we adopted a, uh, you know, we had that policy of cutting our population. We don't have that many uh, women that we can drag in off the farm to, to assemble your iPhones. We have to develop higher tech. We have to develop bigger profit margins. I think Nixon and Kissinger understood that, and they understood it was going to be a multi polar world. I think that I know people are going to get very angry at me, but I, I, when I talked to Nixon about that, he was very clear. We have to get used to the idea that it is not going to be an America-centric world. And isn't, isn't that the big issue right now? So so there is that. Um, there are a lot of foreign policy people who are, who are kind of Kissingerian realists. 
And uh, recently, Graham Allison, who is kind of a latter day uh, version of that Harvard Kennedy School, someone I knew for years as well, wrote this book called The Thucydides Trap. And his argument was basically, look, uh, irrespective of all the individual choices that China and the United States governments are making, there's an inevitability of conflict because rising powers always come into conflict with with incumbent powers. The United States, the incumbent power, China's the rising power, and therefore they're going to conflict kind of almost regardless of, of decisions made. I think that's way too sort of structurally fatalistic, and it misses the fact that it's always contingent. There's always a lot of decisions made. And the central point that you raised that Nixon was aware of that that there are going to be other centers of power. And yeah, it's certainly true that Nixon going to China was also designed as a as a counterpoint to the Soviet Union, you know, to to create a different axis. Something why I wish the Biden administration would learn from now. Like if you really think Putin's Russia is the great threat to the international order. And in many ways, you know, Putin's a much more active threat to the international order than Xi Jinping has been. The fact that China might at some point invade Taiwan hypothetically doesn't make it a contemporary threat to the international order as opposed to you know Putin who has actually invaded Ukraine and threatened to use nuclear weapons now if you really want to you know contain Putin it would kind of make a lot of sense to work with the Chinese as opposed to we'll just fight whoever we want to fight at simultaneously never a great idea and yet we seem not to have gotten that memo either and uh, I've asked people about this you know I know a fair number of people in policy. I'm, I'm not saying that in a name dropping way. It just happens to be the kind of people I grew up with uh, intellectually and professionally. And like, wh- how many ships should China be able to have in, in the South China Sea? Like, what's, what's the number, what's the size of its navy that you, if you were an American policymaker, would go? China's a powerful country with one and a half billion people. It makes sense that they would have X number of ships. And we, we, the United States apparently can have 10 aircraft carrier groups or 11 or whatever the current number is. And we think that that's kind of legit. How many could the Chinese have? And it'd be legitimate as opposed to, oh my God, you know, they're challenging us. And, 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 and it's, you know, I don't think American policymakers are really used to thinking this way. Like how much autonomy and power is China allowed to have if you're the United States? And and I've gotten a lot of pushback when I make these arguments over the past few years saying, oh, you, Zachary, sound just like what the Communist Party's rhetoric is when they're trying to counter the United States. And, and it's true. There are times when the Communist Party and their official news organs say the same thing. You know, the United States doesn't want us to have any ships or doesn't want us to become a great power. The fact that it's said by propaganda agencies in China does not make every single one of those questions incorrect, right? Um, they're smart. They they they're they're clever. It doesn't get them off the hook for all the things they're doing domestically and internationally that are equally problematic to the United States. But again, I'm an American whose whose primary sense of responsibility is to hold my own society accountable or to urge my own society to be better. Um, I'm I'm not going to shape the nature of the Communist Party in China, and that's not I think what my focus should be. Time for a break, uh, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Shaka Tafara. Growing up a Jamaican kid in Venice Beach, it was important to my mom that we had a connection to Africa. But the concept of the motherland was hard to digest until I fell in love with LA's only African enclave, Little Ethiopia. Join me for an audio love letter to the neighborhood. Listen now to my two-part series at kcrw.com slash Little Ethiopia. We're back with Sheer Intelligence and our guest. Well, let me ask you a basic question because uh, uh, I'm much older than you, but still you've lived through m- much of this history. We have these magic words, you know, two of which are democracy and communism. And for a while there, we were able to see it as, you know, one is freedom and one is slavery and so forth. At the beginning days of the Cold War, India was going to be the free democracy, you know, the Nehru and so forth. Uh, and obviously the communist bloc was always going to be evil. And, and the fact is, these words, people had to know in real time didn't ma- mean a whole lot. Uh, India has been more or less free at different times, depending upon domestic pressures, economic and otherwise, and how much 
dissent they will tolerate. And the irony here is that Nixon was fighting this war as the Democrats actually had started it in Vietnam to stop, not Vietnam, Vietnam was never going to be a threat to anybody militarily, but it was aimed at China, which had had a revolution. And then first we had this opening to Russia. And the irony here with the Russia thing is uh, you're, you're advocating, I think makes perfect sense to somehow put some distance between China and Russia, but Russia is run by the anti-communist, whatever his background. Uh, he was the guy the U.S. was backing first with Yeltsin and then with Putin against what remained of the Communist Party. And in fact, we didn't even like Gorbachev because he didn't break with that party. So so the, the experts that you sometimes meet and refer to, they got it all wrong. They thought communism had a real power. No, nationalism had the power. China is primarily driven by nationalism. Their whole history reeks of, of a wounded nationalism. And if the Communist Party is going to survive, as your book points out, it has to deliver. It has to deliver. And the, the whole movement of reform was to deliver on consumer goods, on individual opportunity, to at least concede consumer sovereignty to some degree of freedom. Uh, that in many ways is a decentralized society. Its power doesn't extend. So, And again, the irony, we now consider Vietnam a very good potential ally, and they are uh, run by a, a communist party that has certainly a, a long history and one of rivalry. With, with so I'm, I'm, I'm really, what I liked about your book was a, was a different assertion of realism, of what makes things tick. And you have, I never thought I would be cheering on the CEO of Federal Express, for example, or Kentucky Fried Chicken, for that matter. And, and yet your book brings this, this counter-revolution of, of, of American capitalism that was incredibly successful in pushing China in a different direction than our military power could push them. The military power, we were isolating them, and they were becoming ever more radical. With Kentucky Fried Chicken, with Avon, with, with, with Federal Express, on and on, up through Apple, they actually uh, develop a society in which hundreds of million, what, three, four hundred million have been lifted out of the worst poverty. People can travel more. We have at the school I teach at USC, there's 6,000 Chinese students. They don't seem to me overly intimidated. They seem to me very alert, questioning, learning a lot. And so it's been a great success, even from a human rights point of view, yeah. if you actually look at the numbers. And so what I'm really asking about is, do we have adults watching the store? I, With I, all due respect I, to I, some people you mentioned, what are they doing now? Why do they want to push uh, China or, and for that matter, Putin? Yes, uh, Putin has done reckless uh, wrong things, but but Nixon went and negotiated right with Mao. Right, <laughs> you know where are we now? And you, your book, you, your writing in general, um, I'm not cursing it. It reeks <laughs> of logic, fact, uh, and so forth. Where is that now? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Bob, and I also I, I really appreciate you talking about getting people to really not just rest on on these words, you know, democracy and communism, as if they have just clear meaning. You know, we, we use them as labels and they're supposed to have clear meaning, you know, democracy good, communism bad. But then you really need to look at, okay, what does that mean in terms of these specific societies? And look, I, I, I've been adamant for years about, if you're gonna take the moral high ground about human rights, and maybe you should take the moral high ground. I mean, I think whatever China is doing, in Uyghur land is atrocious, meaning I think it is morally wrong to silence an entire other people, just like I think it's wrong for the you know the Turks to do it to the Kurds now. And um, but it, it you know it was morally wrong for the United States to intern two hundred thousand Japanese Americans in nineteen forty two to nineteen forty five, and I do think that moral equivalency about these things is is important. You know, we it wasn't exactly. A shining moment of American democracy to invade Iraq in 2003, which many people now point out about, um, you know, Putin and and Ukraine. You know, the fact that we did it doesn't make it better than the fact that he does it. it, it hundreds of thousands of people died for no good reason, regardless, and at our hands. And 
I am not saying this at all from like a negative, like, oh, I don't like the United States. I'm saying like we're a, a great and flawed society like most societies. And we ought to be our starting point ought to be some internal recognition of that, especially when we're going to preach about human rights. And I am dismayed at the the easy groove that we have now kind of entered this neo Cold War. And it's neo because we still remain, as I pointed out at the beginning, unbelievably entwined economically, which I think is kind of a missing fact in a lot of these discussions. Like there are there are almost two two separate realities going on here, which is that the economic interdependence continues. It may have it may have leveled off in the pace at which it was going, but it hasn't contracted. And the sort of political uh, social rhetoric and aspect, which is also intense from Xi Jinping. I mean, he is clearly using the nationalism of anti-Americanism as a way of consolidating power, just like he used COVID as a way of vastly expanding the digital surveillance state in a way that pre-COVID they were failing to do. So they've, you know, they're taking advantage of their of their external adversaries, COVID and the United States, to create a domestic sort of security authoritarianism that I would not want to live in and I certainly would not want to export. Although what's fascinating about China is they don't even seem interested in exporting it. So why we're so hell bent on seeing them as an ad, as an enemy, right? Like I try to get to people to think in what way is China actually a threat? What what are they threatening? Are they threatening your job at USC? Are they thre- is there any immediate or even tangential threat of like a Chinese authoritarian surveillance state coming to the United States. I mean, Trump may be a threat in all sorts of ways, but he's not that kind of threat. He's a whole other different kind of threat, but that has nothing to do with China. And so when it comes to the adults, the one thing I come back to, and maybe this is facile, is that we have, and you know this better than anybody, Bob, is we have a national security bureaucracy set up in the late 40s to fight a military ideological state-based rival i.e. the Soviet Union, that after the Cold War began to shrink in the 1990s, but never really fully shrank. Then you had 9-11, and that hypercharged that apparatus, except Islamic fundamentalism and kind of decentralized adversaries, non-state actors, wasn't a great fit for the Pentagon and other things. China is so perfectly cast as the adversary for a, a system that was set up to deal with an adversary. And I think it's very hard once you're in government, particularly, to not enter that groove. And China is so perfect for that groove, even though it totally misses all this other stuff, which is that the economic interdependence was simply a good thing. (laughs) It was a net good thing for the United States. It wasn't a good thing for every American. Yes, some Americans lost their jobs, but as many, far more Americans benefited from lower cost goods and services that China provided, then lost their jobs because of Chinese manufacturing. And a lot of the jobs that, w- that were lost to manufacturing were lost to robots and um, robotization as much as they were lost to China. And, and, and that economic integration, as you said, was good for China. It was good for hundreds of millions of Chinese, and it remains good. And I just wish, clearly in a way that is naive, um, that we had stayed more with that reality and not slid into this really pre-existing groove of we're looking for an enemy and we found one well you know also though i i I think you're too kind to (laughs) america's role in the world no i i first of all when i was at that china center and orlo was there we mentioned him before good fellow uh you know the whole argument was that china could never develop because their population was so great all right and the fact is their population then was, again, between four and 500 million. They now have at least 900 million more. Uh, and yet, you know, when they've done things, and for instance, their one-child policy, which is, was the most controversial uh, human rights policy that, that they did, but there were plenty of population control people uh, in the world who said, you have to control the population. You have to have family planning. You have to put this pressure. Now, of course, they have a potential labor shortage because it it was overly successful, whatever you think of its morality. But it's almost like they can't win. And I really wonder, because 
you know, first of all, our history with China, let's, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, we discriminated. We, we had the <laughs> exclusion that we, we, you couldn't even get married in this country if you were a Chinese worker who'd come to work on the railroad or, 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 or in the mines. I mean, the, you mentioned the rounding up of the Japanese. Uh, you know, the first legitimate marriage actually in California happened in forty. Three, when they recognize, hey, China's our ally now, so uh, people should be able to bring their wives over or have wives or what have you. I mean, it was it's grotesque, the discrimination against China, the depiction in our mass media and everything. And I would point out, by the way, uh, these wars that we fought to stop Chinese communism, Korean War uh, certainly being one in which we leveled you know, every every building there, uh, Vietnam, in which, you know, McNamara said he would have been considered a war criminal if we didn't lose. Well, we did lose. And, uh, you know, somewhere between uh, three and a half and what, five, six million Indo-Chinese were, were killed. And, and now no one bothers to even think, how could that happen? If we know what we're doing and we're so well-intentioned and democracy works, how do you kill you know, what, at least three and a half, four, five million people in a war that never made any sense against a country that you said would invade us if we lost that war. Uh, we did lose that war. They won. And now they're the ones that we think are ideal capitalists. And they're the ones we want business to do with. We don't like China because China's too independent. So I'm asking basically, isn't it the independence, whether it's uh, India now uh, whether it's going to be Brazil again on under Lulu soon, uh, uh, whether they're small or big, that the United States cannot stand capitalist competition, which after all was supposed to be the great strength of capitalism. It was international, right? It broke down barriers. Uh, it had competitive advantage. Where are, nobody believes that anymore. If the Chinese come up with a better 5G, oh, we won't let them sell it. They come up with TikTok, we won't let that practice. So really, we're hypocrites, aren't we? Oh, I do think we're hypocrites. I mean, there's no, there's no question about that. Um, there is the degree to which I think most countries are and you'll probably disagree with me on this, but I, I mean, I think most countries are, uh, are, are hypocritical about their I've own past. Those, first of all, I'm not naive about how bad these, I was in China during the Cultural Revolution just before Nixon went. You know, I was scared out of my mind. I was held by the Red Guard at the airport for four days or so, lectured, uh, you know, uh, about the right way. They wouldn't let me spend my money. It was the evil dollars of capital. I, I, I've been in totalitarian countries. I, Believe me, I have no kind feelings about them. It's a horror. Uh, that's not the point. The point is, uh, what right do you have to make other people's history? For oh, I totally agree. And with the that. irony, yeah, and the irony is that in your book, in loving detail, your book is a tribute to capitalism as as a pure form, market capitalism. And you have the Avon. For God's sake, I never thought I would be fantasizing about Avon, you know, or Kentucky fried chicken. The <laughs> idea of this huge Kentucky fried chicken opposite the moral uh, the, the memorial to Mao. Mao is buried, right? Opposite the biggest Kentucky fried chicken place in the world. And somehow that was consistent with reform. That is a tribute to capitalism, not that one has to eat Kentucky fried chicken, but the recognition that the walls will come down because people want choice. They want to make their own decisions, including about what they eat and what they buy and where they travel. And and that was the wisdom of Nixon's opening. And we've lost that now. Totally. And as you know, I mean, the most recent book I wrote, which was about this old American private investment firm called Brown Brothers Harriman, um, is also in many ways a kind of a celebration of capitalism. But it's a celebration of there are a lot of forms of that capitalism can take uh, other than shareholder capitalism that has become dominant and you know i think in many ways uh even at nixon's time that was right before kind of shareholder capitalism became the whole the whole mantra and uh back to your point about we use these words you know democracy liberalism capitalism communism they all have a lot of different flavors right they're not they don't have just like static meaning and 
we should constantly be looking at what do we mean when we talk about these things. So when I am supportive of capitalism, as in, you know, it's it's a it's a basic assumption that human beings worldwide have always been driven by trying to secure their most basic needs: food, clothing, shelter, health. You know, having some autonomy over their families and their lives, and some connection to their communities, and whatever ism system helps shape that most effectively tends to have some traction at any given time you know a lot of 20th century capitalism has been better at providing that to more people than a lot of other isms have been over time and that is certainly true of american capitalism but it could be defined much differently and and again what i'm so struck by about american policy toward china today is almost how detached from our own domestic economy it's become you know i i i think talk about playing with fire that, that American policymakers in the national security bureaucracy um, really don't understand how domestically destructive a rupture with China would be. And I don't, I don't mean the kind of rhetorical Cold War that we have. And I think they get how destructive a military conflict would be because that's, that's their bread and butter. But not understanding that the, the harm that this conflict can potentially do to everyday Americans, even without a shot being fired. Uh, the, the indifference to that, I think, is, is stunning and really, really a massive failing uh, of, of that group of policymakers. Well, just imagine Amazon without China in the middle of in, in our pandemic. Yeah. What, what, what were you going to order? I yeah. mean, I ask my students everything that you're using and wearing and everything else. What if in the middle of that pandemic, we had really bought into Donald Trump's demonization of China and the China virus, neglecting the last great pandemic of 100 years ago that started in Kansas? We didn't call it the Kansas virus. But nonetheless, whatever they did in mishandling or how the idea of demonizing China at a moment when we were so dependent upon them. I mean, you have to really wonder about where's the practical thought. But that's all the time we have for to ask about practical thought. I want to say, by the way, I would love to come back and do a, one on Harriman. I've always, Harriman was the central figure, I think, on Wall Street before he became a politician, but the Harriman family. Yep. And that's the book you did a year ago, right? Yep. Inside Money. Yeah. Inside Money. So read Inside Money, and maybe we'll be able to have a discussion about that. But you can still get uh, uh, Zachary Carmel's book, 2009. I, I hope it's reissued, but it it's is. there. It's a Simon & Schuster. It's available. I know. I got it, <laughs> again, through uh, Amazon's Kindle. Uh, I'm not supposed to say that. I tried to get it from the independent store, but I couldn't get it quickly enough. Uh, and... Uh, it, 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 the book is called Superfusion, How China and America Became One Economy and Why the, why the World Depends Upon It. I happen to still believe in that subtitle, every, although everybody around me seems to be abandoning it. Uh, but anyway, and so hopefully we'll have you back to talk about your, your most recent book. I want to thank Christopher Ho at KCRW, along with, um, uh, led by actually nowadays uh, in posting these things, Laura Kondergin. Uh, for getting these things posted on KCRW. It's a very strong NPR station in Santa Monica. Joshua Shear, who is our executive producer and found the speaker and the subject uh, for us. And Natasha Kimi Zapata, who is the overall editor of the program. And the JKW Foundation, which in the memory of Gene Stein, a fiercely independent writer and public intellectual, for helping support this. See you next week with another edition of sheer intelligence. Non, je ne regrette rien. C'est fait.